and so we look forward to your walk. She wears rose-colored glasses, but that's fine. Um, like she said, my name is Katie, and I am presenting a blog that I wrote for my Old Testament as literature class last semester called Studying the Oak Testament, because I knew a friends. Um, so, like many of us living in this region, I grew up not studying the Bible in a literary context, but in a religious context. And that has really shaped who I am as a person, so I don't resent that, but I do sort of disagree with the way that the church can sometimes wrap up the Bible in this nice, neat package to where everything is clean and um, happy and safe. And if you actually study the Bible, especially in a, in a literary context, you'll learn that the God of the Hebrew narrative is um, anything but normal, which is good. It makes a good story. <laughs> um, so it wasn't really until I came to college that I learned to study the Bible through a literary context. But studying it has allowed me to notice all the sort of intricate details between the characters and their stories and their relationship with their God, who I'll either refer to as Yahweh or the protagonist. Um, and the intricate detail that I'll focus on in this presentation is the motif of oak trees in the Old Testament, and especially in relation to the story of King Saul. So who is King Saul? Uh, Saul was this guy. He was a Benjaminite, which is the lowest tribe of all the tribes of Israel, and he wasn't an especially uh, interesting Benjaminite either. He sort of wasn't super high up on the social spectrum. Um, and when he became king, he wasn't looking to become king either. He was looking for something quite different, actually. Um, so in 1 Samuel 9, Saul's father, Kish, sends him to look for his donkeys, because his donkeys have gone missing. So Saul takes one of his servants, and they go for several days, and they're looking for these donkeys. Um, but they can't find them after several days, and so Saul says, well, my father's going to start worrying about us more than he worried about the donkeys. We need to go home. And so the servant says, okay, but we're really close to this city called Zeph, and they knew that in Zeph there lived a man of God, which is what they called prophets. And they're like, why don't we stop here and we'll ask the prophet if he knows where the donkeys are. Because that's what the prophets are for, right? <laughs> so Saul says, okay, let's do that. Um, so, oh, I got to myself, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so they go and they talk to Samuel. And not only does Samuel not tell them where the donkeys are, but he says, hey, you're Saul. So Yahweh has chosen you to be the very first king of Israel. Um, which is not at all what Saul is looking for. But he, <laughs> he anoints him. Uh, as the king, and then since this is totally coming out of left field for Saul, Samuel says, okay, you're going to go on this journey, and all these very specific things are going to happen, and you're going to meet these very specific people, and that will prove to you that Yahweh has chosen you to be the king of Israel. And that brings us to chapter 10, verse 3. <clears throat> then you shall go on from there farther and come to the oak of Tabor. Three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you there. One carrying three young goats, one carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. So, like I said, he's going on this journey so he can see all of these things happen, and it will be confirmed to him that Yahweh has actually chosen him to be the very first king, even though he was just looking for some donkeys. <laughs> <laughs> the donkeys were fine, by the way. That's not an issue too, but they're fine. <laughs> so, of all the details that I just read in verse 3 about the wine and the goats, the oak tree is kind of <laughs> but um, actually, oak trees have a lot of literary significance, and it, it carries more weight in this story than it seems to, if you look a little deeper. Because oak trees are recurring. The word oak, or terebinth, as it's often translated, um, occurs about 24 times in just the Old Testament, so it kind of keeps popping up. They're cultural. Um, a lot of the pagan religions that the Israelites, of the people that the Israelites are surrounded by, sort of view oak trees as being symbols of fertility and immortality, and the Israelites had a habit of sort of adapting to the pagan cultures around them. So they had cultural significance to the Israelites as well because of the other pagan religions. They're necessary. Especially when the Israelites were um, more nomadic, they tended to dwell near oak trees because they provided shade and they could use them for wood and they were just sort of a symbol of safety. So they've always sort of been necessary to the and they're also ingrained in the Hebrew narrative. <clears throat> so I mean several things by this. 
First, uh, the Hebrew word for oak is derived from the word that means sort of providence or divine guidance. So the very name of the oak tree kind of shows its significance from the very beginning. But also there are several other tree occurrences, if you will, that have happened before this story we saw. Um, other Hebrew characters sort of have faith-defining moments at or near oak trees. I'm going to talk about a few of those and how they mirror King Saul's story. So all these, yeah, all these characters have lived and died long before Saul, but their relationship to random oak trees kind of connects them all together. So first we have Abraham and the oaks of Mora in Genesis 12, 1 through 7. So Abraham, as you might know, is sort of the father of the Israelites. He's kind of the guy that they all look back to and they say, well, Abraham did this, so we would do this. But uh, Abraham leaves his home with pretty much no direction at all, at all because he always says, I'm going to give you this land. And so Abraham goes and Yahweh shows him the land of the Canaanites, who at, at that time it's occupied by the Canaanites. But he says, I'll give you all this land. And so in response, Abraham builds an altar to Yahweh and his homes at the Oak of Morah. And then in the next chapter, something very similar happens. Kind of just to reiterate the previous promise, Yahweh sends Abraham on this walk. And he's like, as far as you can walk and as far as you can see, all of this land will be given to your descendants. And Abraham's like, cool, okay. And so he, <laughs> he resettles his tents at the Oaks of uh, Mamre and builds an altar to Yahweh there. So we have two altars at Oak Trees from Abraham. And then we have Abraham's uh, grandson, Jacob, and the terebinth of Shechem. Um, Jacob is kind of in a similar situation as Abraham in that he's being called away from his home and he has to uh, just go, not know where he's going, and take his family. And so he tells his family to leave the foreign gods that they've adopted behind. And so Jacob takes his family's uh, like pagan rings and totems and all of those things and he buries them under this oak tree at Shechem and then they move on from there. And then in the very same chapter, actually, as they're on their journey, uh, Deborah, who was Rebecca, Jacob's wife, who's her uh, nurse, I think, she dies, and she's been a part of Jacob's family for a long time, and so they sort of have this, like, uh, mourning ritual, and then they bury her at an oak in Bethel, and they rename the place Alam Bakuth, which means oak of weeping. And then later on down the timeline, we have Joshua, who was the leader after Moses, after the Israelites had left Egypt. And uh, the last thing, J Joshua spends most of his time trying to refocus the Israelites because they get easily distracted as they wander. <laughs> um, so he spends his time refocusing them. And the very last thing he does before he dies is he says, uh, the Israelites have sort of abandoned God and they're like, he was never here for us. And you might know this verse because it's on... Uh, signs at Hobby Lobby and stuff like that. But it's, <laughs> it's a verse that says, Choose you this day, and you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But it's actually a really cool story because Joshua is like, Don't you remember all the things that he's done? And he goes through and he lists all the things that he always done for his people. And he says, Choose right now if you're going to serve him or not. And the people are like, You're right, we'll serve him. And so Joshua, right, he makes this covenant based on the people's uh, decision to serve God. And he calls it the Book of the Law, and he buries it under the Terebinth tree at Shechem, which is where Jacob was earlier, because there's a sanctuary posted there. And then soon after that, he goes. But um, anyway, and then later we have Gideon. If you can believe this or not, the Israelites have turned away from God again, and they're sort of being held captive by the Midianites. And so they're all kind of scared, and they're like, maybe we should ask Yahweh to save us. Gideon is one of those people who's sort of skeptical and scared. And then Yahweh appears to him, and he just goes, and he sits under this tree in Ophrah. And he starts talking to Gideon, and he says, I'm going to choose you to lead this very small army and defeat the Midianites. And Gideon's like, mm, doubtful. And so uh, he asks for all these signs, like a piece of fleece, I think. And he asks God to show him all these signs to show him that he can trust him. And uh, so you will probably notice that there's several similarities between these characters' stories around oak trees. First of all, it's just the location. Um, it's important to note that Abraham and Joshua's trees are mentioned as being close to the Canaanite city of Shechem, which is like, I don't know if you can see that arrow, but it's right there. 
And then um, Jacob and Saul's trees are both around Bethel. And then Gideon's tree is close by in Ophrah. So they're all sort of right there together. And the text also suggests that they might have been, like in the connected character stories, they might have been the exact same tree, which is really cool. Um, but also, there's a common theme kind of running through these stories, like and what they represent to each character, what the oak trees represent. So um, Abraham's trees represent Yahweh's promise to give his people the land of the Canaanites. And then I apparently already clicked that one, but Jacob's trees represent burying the past and consequently moving on from it. So he buries the idols and he buries his loved one and then they keep moving on. And then, though it's probably the exact same tree as Abraham's, Joshua's tree kind of represents the inverse of what Abraham's did. Because Joshua's tree represents Yahweh's people's promise back to him, which is cool. I'm pretty sure that was an English picture. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Gideon's tree represents confirmation of Yahweh's power through the signs and miracles that he shows him that he can trust him. And so through these intertwined stories alone, we can learn a lot about the protagonist, Yahweh, and about the message that the Hebrew narrative continually tries to teach its readers. And that is uh, Abraham and Joshua's trees teach that Yahweh is a God of promise, and Jacob and Gideon's trees teach that Yahweh delivers his people from sorrow and from their own past and their own mistakes. So let's get back to Saul. You'll remember him from the beginning. How does all of this connect back to King Saul? Well, several of the details that we mentioned in the other character situations are sort of mirrored in Saul's situation. Um, for example, Yahweh is fulfilling his promise to give his people a king, just like he fulfilled his promise to Abraham. And then uh, Yahweh is also totally changing the hero's plans. This is not at all what Saul planned. It wasn't what Jacob planned when he built his life, and then all of a sudden he had to leave it. But he changes the hero's plans and then leads them on to something else. And then uh, strength. Yahweh will use Saul to make the nation of Israel stronger, just like he used Joshua to kind of keep them together every time they turned away. And then signs. This is probably the strongest connection, is that um, Samuel promises that Yahweh will give Saul all of these signs so that he knows that he can trust him, just like he gave Gideon all of those signs for the exact same reason. And then this is cool. Going further into the reign of King Saul, we can kind of see how his character is similar to like an actual physical oak tree. Um, an oak tree is kind of the most important tree to the Israelite people because it has the strongest wood. So they use it a lot. And um, when Saul begins his reign as king, he's a very strong, I mean, he's the first king, so there's nothing to compare it to. But he's still like a very, <laughs> he's a strong king. And he conquers their enemies and he brings the nation closer together. At first, he's a very good king. But um, what's cool about oak trees is that a lot of times they can hollow out when they start to die, and then they split right down the middle. I should have put a picture because it's really cool, but it's just like a hollow tree and it's split down the middle. And you can see that in King Saul as he falls because he sort of just becomes a hollow man. He's consumed with his greed and his jealousy over David and the fact that he wasn't the king that he was meant to be. And he sort of just kind of hollows out. And then he splits not only his family, but the nation of Israel sort of falls to defeat because of Saul's uh, greed and jealousy. And then this is the coolest part. <laughs> the most interesting part of um, Saul's story in relation to oak trees is that uh, different instances in the reign of King Saul can kind of be framed by oak trees. So we have what we talked about earlier, his anointing near the oak and tamer, and uh, he becomes king then. Everything's good so far. It happens near the oak tree. And then there's a verse in 1 Samuel 22 where he has sort of gone mad at this point, and he's just sitting under uh, the Tamarisk of Gibeah, it says. And he's sitting there, and he's turned against all of his men because he thinks they're plotting against him. And he's trying to kill David, and he's killing these priests, and that's just sort of a moment that you can look at this picture and see that he's kind of going insane. And he's sitting under an oak tree. And then when the tragic character commits suicide at the end of his life, um, his body is disgracefully torn apart, which is bad for anyone, but especially a king. And uh, later, his people find his bones, and they take them, and they bury them under the Tamarisk of Jabesh. 
So all of King Saul's reign is sort of framed by oak trees. He's anointed, he rises, he falls, and then he's buried all around oak trees. <coughs> so, in conclusion, <laughs> oak trees are incredibly powerful in this symbolic motif throughout the Old Testament. And they meant a lot to the Hebrew people, but they add a lot to the story as we read it now. Um, and they make it an even more interesting story than it already is. King Saul is probably, his story is probably the most interesting in terms of oak trees because it not only connects him to his uh, tree hub forefathers, but it also reflects who he will ultimately be as a king. And it also um, continues to display Yahweh as a strong and uh, consistent protagonist because of all these former connections. And um, I'm thankful to JSU for giving me the opportunity to actually study the Bible through literary scope so that I can notice simple and deeply rooted details like the tree.